Welcome everyone to a new classroom called the College of Glycation. I am Professor Paul Reynolds, a biomedical scientist and professor of cell biology. I hope that this course will serve as a classroom type setting where you can learn about the latest information in the areas of glycation, inflammation, and overall health. For today's first classroom, we're going to navigate a lesson called Glycation 101, the sticky mess of sugar and why it matters. We need to start at the beginning, cover the basics, and I'm so glad you're here to learn. Today we're driving into a topic that is as fascinating as it is fundamental, glycation. If you've never heard of it, don't worry. This is Glycation 101, your introductory pass into a process that's quietly shaping your health, your aging, and maybe even how long you'll live on this planet. We're going to unpack what glycation is, how it happens, why sugar is the ringleader in this metabolic circus, and what the science, real peer-reviewed science, tells us about keeping it under control. Spoiler alert, it's going to involve carbohydrates, ketosis, and a hard look at those all-too-pervasive sugary treats. So let's get started. What is glycation? The basics. Let's kick things off with the essentials. Glycation is what happens when sugar molecules like glucose or fructose decide to get a little too friendly with proteins, fats, or even DNA in your body. Picture this, a sugar molecule bumps into a protein and instead of a polite handshake, it latches on like an overzealous barnacle. No enzymes are involved here. It's a spontaneous, chemical free-for-all. The result, a new dysfunctional compound called an advanced glycation end product, or age for short. These ages are troublemakers. They stiffen tissues, trigger inflammation, and generally cause havoc on your cellular machinery. The process itself happens in stages. First, you've got the initial hookup. Imagine a sugar molecule reacts with a protein, and what happens is it forms what's called a Schiff base. This is reversible, so it's no big deal just yet. Your body can still back out of this bad interaction. But give it time, and that Schiff base rearranges into something called an Amidori product. Think of this as the point where the relationship gets a bit more serious still technically reversible, but it's starting to stick. Then through a messy cascade of reactions, sometimes those can be oxidation or dehydration, you name it, these amidori products turn into ages. And once you've got ages, there's no breaking up. They're permanent and they're not leaving without causing some damage. Now, this isn't just a lab curiosity. Glycation happens in your body every day and it's accelerated by how much sugar is floating around in your bloodstream. That's where diet comes in, specifically carbohydrates. But before we get to that, let's take a quick detour through the history to see how we got here. So here's a brief history of glycation and ages. Glycation isn't new. It's been around as long as life has. But our understanding of it, that's a more recent story. Back in 1912, a French chemist named Louis Camille Malliard stumbled onto this process while trying to figure out how amino acids and sugars react when they are heated. He wasn't thinking about human health at the time. He was more interested in the browning of food, like the crust on your bread or the sear on your steak. Turns out that Malliard reaction isn't just a kitchen trick. It's the same chemistry that forms ages in your body. Who knew your toast and your arteries had so much in common? So let's now fast forward to the 1980s and scientists started connecting the dots between glycation and disease. A landmark paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, clear back in 1984 by Brownlee and colleagues, showed that ages were piling up in diabetic patients, linking them to complications like kidney damage and vascular stiffness. This wasn't just a sugar problem, it was a chronic sugar problem. A pivotal moment came in the study of hemoglobin A1C, or HbA1c. You've probably heard of this before. 
HbA1c is a glycated form of hemoglobin that is elevated in diabetic patients. A 2004 review in Circulation Research notes that A1c became a game changer for monitoring blood sugar control, and it revealed how glycation reflects long-term glucose exposure. Since then, research has exploded, showing ages are implicated in everything from Alzheimer's to heart disease to plain old aging. But here's where it gets interesting. It's not just what's happening inside us. Did you know that we are also eating ages? Processed foods, think grilled meats, fried snacks, anything caramelized or crispy, all of those types of foods are loaded with ages. A 2010 study in the Journal of American Diabetic Association by Yiribari and his team cataloged ages in the content of over 500 different types of foods. Overcooked or grilled meat, off the charts. Steamed foods, barely a blip. So the trend is clear. The more we've le leaned into processed, sugar-heavy diets, the more ages we're shoveling in and the data backs this up. Over the last century, sugar consumption has skyrocketed. In 1900, the average American ate about five pounds of sugar a year. Today, it's closer to about 130 pounds annually. That's a 26-fold increase, and our cells are paying the price. So let's talk about the science of glycation, what the studies say. If we dig into the evidence, because this isn't just me pontificating, there's hard data here. Cell culture studies have been a goldmine for understanding glycation at the ground level. Let's take a look at a 2015 study from the Journal of Biological Chemistry. In that case, researchers exposed endothelial cells. Those are the cells that line each of your blood vessels. And they exposed those cells to high glucose levels. What happened? Well, glycation kicked into overdrive, forming ages that gummed up the cell's ability to relax and contract. The result was stiffer vessels, a hallmark of cardiovascular disease. This isn't just hypothetical. It's what's happening in your arteries when your blood sugar spikes. Another study, this one from the Journal of Diabetes in 2018, looked at skin cells cultured in high glucose conditions. The ages that formed didn't just sit there. In fact, what they did was they triggered inflammation by binding to a receptor of ages, or RAGE, the receptor for advanced glycation end products. And this binding set off a cascade of pro-inflammatory signals, the kind that fuel chronic diseases. Rage is like a bouncer at the club who lets in all the wrong people, and once they're in, the party gets ugly. But it's not just cell cultures. Human studies also echo these discoveries. A 2013 paper in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition tracked age intake in healthy adults. Those eating high-age diets, like lots of fried foods and sugary junk, had higher levels of circulating ages and markers of oxidative stress. Compare that to a low-age diet. Think whole foods, minimal processing, and the differences here were stark. Less damage, less inflammation. So what's the takeaway? Well, what you eat matters, and sugar is the accelerant. So let's look at sugar, carbs, and the glycation connection. Why focus on sugar? Well, sugar is the fuel for this fire. When you eat carbohydrates, they break down into glucose. Simple carbs like white bread or soda hit your bloodstream fast, spiking your blood sugar. Complex carbohydrates like whole grains take longer, but they still add to the pool. And the more glucose floating around, the more opportunities for glycation to ramp up. Fructose, which is found in high fructose corn syrup, is even worse. It is metabolized in the liver and forms ages at a rate 10 times higher than glucose, according to a 2007 study in the Journal of Nutrition. Now, I'm not here to demonize all carbs. Your body can handle some. 
but the modern diet, it is a glycation factory. The average person is eating about 300 to 400 grams of carbs a day, well beyond what our ancestors dealt with. And the result is a constant barrage of sugar molecules looking for proteins to latch onto. That's why controlling carbohydrates is a step, step number one, essentially, in taming glycation. Keep blood sugar low and you starve the process. Which brings us to a topic of ketosis. This is an anti-glycation glycation superpower. If you've been around my work, you know I'm a fan of ketosis, and for good reasons. Ketosis flips the script on glycation. When you cut carbs low enough, say around 50 grams per day or less, your body shifts from burning glucose to burning fat, producing in the process ketones. Blood sugar drops, insulin stays low, and suddenly there's less glucose around to glycate your proteins. A 2019 study in cell metabolism showed that ketogenic diets reduced markers of glycation in mice and human trials. Another one from Nutrition and Metabolism in 2020 found similar drops in age levels in people on a ketogenic diet. This isn't just theory. I've seen it in my own research as well. Lower carbs induces ketosis, and you're not just losing weight in this case, you're protecting your cells. Now, this is not a cure-all, let's be sure, but it is a powerful tool and it beats a sugar-soaked standard diet hands down. So what are the ills of sugar-based glycation? Let's talk about the consequences, because glycation isn't just a silent bystander. Those ages, imagine they're kind of like molecular graffiti. They tag your tissues and leave a mess. In your blood vessels, as I've talked about before, they stiffen collagen and elastin, making those arteries less flexible. Here comes hypertension. In your brain, they have been linked to neuroinflammation, one of the key features of Alzheimer's disease, which was shown in a 2014 study in Neurobiology of Aging. In your skin, they break down collagen, giving you wrinkles faster than a decade in the sun. And in your kidneys, these ages can compromise filtration, a problem that is well documented in diabetic kidney research. Now, sugar is the culprit here. Now, it's less likely that the ages that you eat, rather than the ones that you make on your own when blood sugar is out of control, is what is happening in the process. And the, here's a kicker. Oxidative stress can amplify all of this. A 2016 study in oxidative medicine and cellular longevity found that high glucose levels crank up reactive oxygen species. These are small, stressful troublemakers that can occur in tissues. And these can, in fact, turbocharge age formation. It's a vicious cycle. Sugar begets glycation, glycation begets damage, and damage begets more glycation. So let's wrap it up. What can we do? So where does this leave us? Glycation is inevitable. We cannot stop it entirely, but we can slow it down. Step one, cut the sugar. Ditch the soda, the pastries, and the processed junk food. Step two, control your carbohydrates. Aim for a low, steady blood sugar level. Ketosis will be your friend here. Step number three, eat real food. Steamed foods beat fried chicken wings or similar things in the age department every time. Step four, stay curious. The science is evolving, but the trend is clear. Less sugar, less glycation, less trouble. So we've covered a lot today. The chemistry, the history, the evidence from cell cultures and beyond. Glycation is a slow burn, but it's one we can, in fact, turn down. So next time you're tempted by that donut, think about those sugar molecules sticking to your proteins and causing problems. Maybe opt for the eggs instead. Your cells will thank you. So that's it today for Glycation 101. If you liked this, share it with someone who needs to hear it. Until next time, keep questioning, keep learning, and I'll see you at the next College of Glycation lesson.